Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss about the instruments of trade policy. First, we must understand that instruments is required for the protective trade policy. If the economy is following free trade, then there is no need of protection. So to discuss about the instruments of trade policy, let me divide the unit in two parts. The first part we are going to discuss about the free trade and in the next part we will explain the protective trade policy. Now before going to discuss about the trade policy, um, first let me explain that why there is trade. First of all, trade is there because of the price difference. For a particular commodity, if there is no price difference between two economies, then there is no need of trade. Generally, the economy where the price of the commodity is relatively higher is interested to purchase the commodity from the economy where the price of the same commodity is relatively lower. So we can easily understand the price difference is the basic reason behind the trade. Now the next question is why there is price difference? To explain, to give the answer of this question, there are basically two approaches. The first approach is called absolute advantage approach and the next approach is called comparative advantage approach. So let me explain one by one. So first one is the absolute advantage approach which was introduced by Adam Smith. Adam Smith said that a country should produce and export the commodity more where he is more productive. That means if the economy can produce a particular commodity relatively more than other country or he has some productive advantage over that commodity production, he should produce the commodity and will export it. So that is the basic reason behind the trade according to Adam Smith or according to absolute advantage theory. Now when this approach is applied in the reality then there comes a problem. What is the problem? According to this approach, if one economy has productive advantage over a commodity, then another economy should have productive advantage over another commodity. Then only they can produce alternative commodities more and more and they can exchange them. So in that case, there is an assumption that both countries should be equally productive or equally strong. But both developed countries or both underdeveloped countries can exchange. So, according to this approach, one developed country cannot trade with some less developed country. Why? Because the less developed country is less productive for any type of production, whereas more developed country is more productive for any type of commodity production. So, in that case, what will happen? In that case, a developed country, if Say there is a trade between a developed country and an underdeveloped country. In that case, what will happen as the developed country has more production capacity to produce most of the commodity, so that country should produce most of the commodity according to the absolute advantage theory and will export it. What about the less developed country? As less developed country doesn't have that productive capacity to produce the commodity, he should not produce anything and will just import. So what should be exported by the less developed country? Nothing. So in that case, there will be no trade. That means there is no commodity for the less developed country to export. So there will be no exchange of the commodities and the trade will stop. So that is the problem of the absolute advantage theory. But when that theory is applied in the reality, it is seen that there are so many examples that the developed countries are trading with the less developed countries and the trade is quite successful. So why this is happening? Absolute advantage theory could not give the answer. So to find out the solution of that real life example, the comparative advantage theory came. So who is the inventor of the comparative advantage theory? The comparative advantage theory concept was introduced by David Ricardo. He said that the trade should not be based on the productivity. It should be based on the concept of opportunity cost. If the country has least opportunity cost to produce some commodity, it should produce the com commodity more and more and will export. On the other hand, if any economy has more opportunity cost to produce some commodity, it should not produce it and will import at the time of trade. So this is how 
all the trade in the real life can be explained with the help of comparative advantage. So, comparative advantage theory is solving the problem of the absolute advantage theory in the real life. Now come the next one that is the free trade. In case of free trade, there is no intervention by the government. Everything is done by the price mechanism. So which we called as invisible hand can work successfully under this system. So in our diagram, we can see that DD is the demand curve and SS is the supply curve. So we have assumed that law of demand and law of supply both are there. And that is why the demand curve is downward sloping and the supply curve is upward rising in the free trade situation. Here E is the equilibrium point where the demand and supply curves are intersecting each other. That means this is the point where both the consumer and the suppliers are satisfied. So corresponding to this equilibrium point E, the P star is the equilibrium price and Q star is the equilibrium quantity. So this is a simple demand supply diagram where there is no intervention, no government policy, nothing is there. Price mechanism is working to clear the market. By chance, if in this market there is any problem of excess demand, then price will increase. And as price is increasing, the demand will fall and the supply will rise. And this is how the market will get its equilibrium. The opposite price mechanism will work if there is any excess supply problem. In that case, price will fall to clear the market. And as price is falling, demand is rising, uh, demand is rising and supply is falling. So this is how the problem of excess supply will be solved by itself and the market will get its equilibrium again. So this is how the free market will work and this is called the free trade situation. Now we are going to another extreme that is the protection. So the, there are so many instruments as the protection policies. The very first instrument which is very known to us is tariff. The second important one is quota. Then after comes the voluntary export restraint, the technical or other administrative restriction, dumping, uh, the international cartel, export subsidy, etc., etc. So for the remaining unit, we are going to discuss all of them one by one. So let me first explain the first one, the very common one, that is the tariff. Here again, the DD and the SS curves, these are, the, the, these are two demand and the supply curves respectively, and they are following the law of demand and law of supply. Initially, the price was P0 in the international market. So if you can see the diagram, we can understand the equilibrium price is quite higher in the domestic market as compared to the international price P0. So as the international price of the same commodity is lower than the domestic market clearing price, so the domestic consumers are interested to purchase them from the international market at the price P0. Now at the price P0, the demand is P0B, whereas the supply in the domestic market is P not A. So there is an excess demand of the amount AB and AB is actually the amount of import by the domestic country. Now if the government is thinking that amount of import is quite high as compared to the economic condition of the economy, then the government may impose tariff. Now the question is what is tariff? Tariff is simply the tax. Now, import tariff means import tax, that means tax on import. If you want to purchase some commodity from rest of the world, you have to give tax to your government. That is nothing but the import tariff. So here, government has imposed the tariff. Why? Because government is thinking the import is quite high. Now here, the tax import tariff rate is P1, P0. This is the tariff rate. Now as this tariff is imposed in the domestic market, so in the domestic market the price has increased to P1. And when the price is increased to P1, then automatically the demand will fall and the domestic supply will increase. And as a result of that, the 
import will be reduced to JM. So this is how government is um, reducing the amount of import and at the same time government is earning the tax revenue from this import tariff. So these are the two positive side of the tariff imposition. First of all government's objective is successful because government wanted to reduce the uh, amount of import and that has been done and in addition to that government is earning some tax revenue from this tariff imposition. Now we are going to discuss the second one that is that quota. Quota is what? Quota is the quantitative restriction on the import. That means if someone wants to purchase some commodity from the rest of the world, there is a limit. Beyond that limit, the consumer cannot purchase from there. After purchasing from the international market, if the consumer still has some demand, that has to be purchased from the domestic market. So that is the thing about the quota. Now there are basically two types of quota. The first one is the absolute quota where the quota, the quantitative restriction is there and you are not allowed to purchase more than this quota amount from the international market. And the second one is the tariff rate quota. Tariff rate quota means first of all quota is there as before. You cannot purchase more than that from the international market. But if you still want to purchase from the international market after your quota, then you can purchase it by paying the tax, that is the tariff. So this is called the tariff rate quota. So here tariff as well as quota both are implemented. So here the quantitative restriction is there as well as the uh, revenue from the uh, tariff imposition is also there. So basically these two type of quota are available in the real life. Now we are going to discuss about the quota with a diagram. Here again the demand curve is downward sloping and the supply curve is upward rising which is indicating that law of demand and law of supplies are there and that is again the international price was P0. Now at the price P0 uh, the uh, domestic consumers are purchasing a lot from the international market and that amount was AB as before. So the government is thinking that it is quite high so he is just imposing one quantitative restriction and what is that? The amount is MN which is quite lesser than AB. So we can understand that now the domestic consumers are not allowed to purchase from the international market more than MN. Now as the quantity is restricted by this policy, automatically the price in the domestic market will increase and it will increase to P1. Now at this P1, now the import is JH which is nothing but MN. So JH is equal to MN. This is how government is restricting the import uh, the quantitative through the quantitative restriction and by that automatically the domestic price has increased from P0 to P1. Now we are going to compare the quota and tariff. If you go through our last two diagrams, you may be confused because these two diagrams are quite similar. That means in apparently tariff and quota, they are very similar by nature. So in that case, the question is, where is the difference between the quota and the tariff? The, there are some differences between the quota and tariff. First of all, tariff is the source, one of the sources of the government revenue, whereas quota is not. Quota is basically the quantitative restriction only. So apparently, quota is not giving any revenue to the government. But sometimes, the quota licenses are sold by the government in the competitive market. In that case, government is earning some amount of revenue by selling those licenses. But at the same time, it is also true that to control that licenses, sometimes the producers or the sellers are using the money. That means a huge expenditure is done by those sellers to control, to get the control over these licenses. Because once they get control over those licenses, they can use their monopoly power in the import sector. So that is a problem of the quota system which is not there in case of tariff. But there is a problem of tariff. Sometimes it is not known that what, what is the elasticity of demand and what is the elasticity of supply of the particular commodity in the international market. 
so in that case sometimes the expected revenue from the tariff is not getting in the reality and that is why generally the producers the domestic producers who are producing the import competing sector in this domestic market are preferring quota not tariff so this is the basic difference between the tariff and quota now we are going to discuss about the another protection policy that is called the voluntary export restraint in short ver now what it is sometimes the importing sector it is requesting the exporting sectors not to export for the time being so this is uh, we can understand this is absolutely based on the political relation between these two economies once this request is accepted the exporting countries for short duration of time are just restricted their export to some commodity to some country so this is how the export control is done but here we have to remember one thing that this is only for the short run in the long run this policy is not applicable and at the same time it is also true that during the time of this restriction the export exporting country may use some other policy so that their revenue will be maintained they can sell some different type of commodity they can improve their production capacity so that once that restriction will be over they can get the revenue which they are now losing so this is how we can say that voluntary export restraint is the solution only for the short duration of time in the long run this is not feasible or this is not profitable for the importing sector now we are going to other uh, protection policies these are called the technical or the administrative protection some other restrictions are sometimes imposed by the import import sectors or import economy uh, and these are based on some health regulation maybe some labeling issue maybe some safety regulation so through these regulations they are trying to reduce the import basically they are trying to help their import competing sector and through this regulation they are trying to restrict the import from rest of the world sometimes they are saying the importing sector they are using the child labor they are not maintaining the proper hygiene they are not using the quality inputs so these are different issues they are sometimes generating just to reduce their import just to protect their domestic economy now we are going to another protection policy that is called the international cartel so cartel means basically the group the group of the economy whose objective is to maximize the joint profit so they are trying to maximize their profit and they are trying to use the monopoly power to the rest of the world so for the rest of the world they are just reducing the commodity sold they are increasing the price of the commodity to earn maximum profit on the other hand among themselves they have reduced the prices and they the restriction among themselves are quite less quite negligible so this is how they are creating the cartel nowadays the cartel is restricted worldwide but still there are some cartel and the most important cartel most known cartel to us is opec opec is actually the group of petroleum exporting countries they are reducing their supply and increasing the price to maximize their profit so opec is a one ideal example of international cartel now we are going to discuss about dumping what is dumping dumping means when the country is selling the commodity in some other country at relatively lower price as compared to its domestic country why he is doing that because he sometimes wants to generate or he wants to do the monopoly for the rest of the world there are different types of dumping one is 
persistent dumping in case of persistent dumping the monopolist the the exporting sector the exporting sector is selling its commodity to the international market at relatively lower price sometimes the price is lesser than its cost of production so it's actually the loss now the question is how that exporting sector is covering his loss because the exporting sector is actually the monopolist in its own economy and there he is asking quite high price so by through this policy he is covering his loss from the international market this is called the persistent dumping the second one is the predatory dumping predatory dumping means just to create the monopoly in the international market for a particular commodity sometimes the exporting sector is selling the commodity at the lower price once the monopoly is there by this company or by this sector then that dumping process will be over and there he will work just as a monopolist this is called the uh, predatory dumping next come the sporadic dumping sporadic dumping means sometimes the production is quite high there is a lot of inventory for a production unit so that country is selling that excess of its production to the rest of the world at the lower price once that inventory stock will be zero then that dumping will also stop this is called the sporadic dumping so these are the different dumping policies which are used by the exporting sector now there are so many examples of dumping for example japan is said to dump so many electronic goods in the usa european countries they are always interested to dump the agricultural product to the rest of the world and as there are so many dumping of textile or some fine papers us economy is using anti dumping policy against the china so in the real life there are so many examples of dumping even if dumping is prohibited dumping is restricted according to the international laws now we are going to discuss about the export subsidy what is export subsidy export subsidy means when the government is giving direct subsidy direct money to the exporting sector so that its production cost will be lower and he can sell that commodity at the lower price in the international market this is called export subsidy so once the production cost is reduced and the exporting sector can sell it at the lower price in the international market so we can say export subsidy is a type of dumping but here uh, again just like dumping export subsidy is also restricted in the international market sometimes the economy cannot give export subsidy in that case what the economy is doing economy is doing some other policies so that the ultimate effect will be the effect of the export subsidy sometimes that economy is giving some low interest loan to the country who is importing his exporting commodity so that that uh, that money will be spent to purchase its exporting commodity so this is how the protection is always there for the exporting sector and indirect dumping is also there now we are going to explain the concept of political protection political protection means sometimes through the political because of the political reason the government is giving some protection to the export sector or the import competing sector the policies are already explained here that means the tariff and quota so here the problem is which sector is import competing sector which sector is required protection for how many times so these are very important with respect to the political background but it must be clear to all of us that once the protection is there this may be helpful for that particular economy but it is harmful for the rest of the world because the balance in the international market is disturbed because of this type of intervention may be political may be some other reason now we are going to discuss about the infant industry argument sometimes basically this is this is very much in, uh, very much available in the less developed economy sometimes some uh, producers are producing the import competing commodities that means they are producing the commodities which are very similar to the commodity which the economy is importing but they are very new in this field poor to struggle with the rest of the world 
to, um, to regarding the price or regarding the quality. So they, they need protection from their own government for the time being. So these industries are called the infant industry. The government is always trying to protect those infant industry uh, through uh, different policies maybe tariff, maybe quota, these are the known policies. At the same time, government is giving the subsidized raw materials to those sectors. They are giving tax reduction to those sectors so that they can get some amount of protection. They can develop themselves and once they can compete with the rest of the world, according to the theory, the industry protection should be taken back. But the problem is, here there are some problems of the infant industry. First of all, we have to find out what is the actual infant industry. And at the same time, this is also seen in the real life that it is quite difficult to remove that protection once it is given to that industry. After giving the protection, it is, uh, it is better not to give protection, it is better to give them production subsidy or any other direct help. Uh, not to give the infant industry protection. Now the last one is the strategic trade policy. Now strategic trade policy is very known in the developed countries. The developed countries are creating some comparative advantage to produce their raw materials by their own. Maybe the semi-finished product or the semiconductor, the telecommunication, these are the thing, these are the areas where the developed countries are investing a lot to make some comparative advantage. So that when these economy, these sectors will develop, they can get a monopoly over this area. So the strategic trade policy is very common in case of developed country. Infant industry protection is very much common in case of less developed country. We can conclude here that um, there may be some protection needed by some areas of your economy. So sometimes government has to give the protection to them. But at the end, uh, it should be clear to all of us that protection is harmful for the international economy as a whole. So the protection should be removed as early as possible. Free trade is the best option for the international perspective.